So, Berto, I just saw the new Steve Jobs movie. Yeah? I've seen all of them. I saw the one in 1999 called Pirates of Silicon Valley, which had yep. Bill Gates in it. I think Noah Wiley played played Steve Jobs. Is it Wiley or Wile? I don't know. Wiley. No, it's Noah Wiley from ER. Yeah. I saw the one in 2013 called Jobs in which uh, Ashton Kutcher. Kutcher? Mm-hmm. Ashton, Ashton Kutcher. <laughs> I, it's like, am I from this planet? Can I Ash, Ashton Wiley <laughs> Kutcher? And then I saw the new one called Steve Jobs just the other night, which was directed by Danny Boyle, who also directed Train Spotting, Slumdog Millionaire, Shallow Grave, Sunshine, and Twenty Eight Days Later. All this, amazing. Yeah, the screenplay is by Aaron Sorkin, who also wrote The Social Network episodes of The West Wing and the movie A Few Good Men. All amazing. In this, in this new film, Jobs is portrayed by My- Michael Fassbender, who was also an X-Men, Inglorious Bastards, Prometheus, A Dangerous Method, Haywire, and Shame, and other movies. All amazing. Yeah, all amazing movies. We grew up with Steve Jobs, didn't we? We did. <laughs> I remember getting an IBM computer in my classroom in 1981, and we were hated by the rest of the school. A girl in my class, her father worked for IBM, and he donated a computer to our classroom. And everyone labeled us as the nerd class, and they hated us because of <laughs> it. I remember nerding out on the computer and learning how to program in DOS and in BASIC. Oh, you don't program in DOS. I bro- program in yeah. BASIC on DOS. I also remember when my friend got a Commodore 64. I remember going to a birthday party at his, at his house. Chris, Chris Glover, my friend. Oh, Chris. Yeah. I, I remember going to a birthday party at his house, and while everyone was playing games, I was programming on the Commodore 64 to run this little lame game that I was programming. <laughs> Later, I took computer programming in junior high. We were using TRS-80s, which were made by Radio Shack, if you can imagine that. Radio Shack was into making computers then. And yep. they called them TRS-80s, and we lovingly called them Trash-80s because they sucked. But I loved it. I loved seeing what you could do with them. I even took the advanced programming class in junior high and began teaching the newer students how to program. I, w- I was like king nerd at the time. <laughs> but, I was, but I was definitely in the minority of people who were into, into computers. What language was that? Still basic? Or were they yeah. doing Pascal or something? Still basic. I did Pascal in high school, actually. <laughs> But I was definitely in the minority, right? Computers were for, were for nerds. And this was the early 80s when nerds were not cool. You know, nerds are cool now. <laughs> nerds were not cool back then. And I remember the release of the Macintosh. There I was using the Trash 80s, the sucky Trash 80s with the command prompts and all that crap. And along comes the first Macintosh. It was amazing. It was mind-blowing. The graphical interface was so intuitive. And it was way beyond anything anyone had ever even thought of before. It was way beyond DOS, way beyond. It's basically the same concept that we use today on every single device that we use, the phone, their computers, iPad, everything. You, yeah. just, you just point and click on stuff. That, it was revolutionary. Before the Macintosh, everything you did on a computer was super unintuitive. You had to know command line language and stuff like that. But with the Macintosh, children could work it. And I wanted one. But Macs were $2,500 back then. And that's in 1984. That's almost $6,000 in, in today's money. $6,000 for a personal computer. That's how much the Microsoft cost back then. The Macintosh. Yeah, the Macintosh. What did I say? The Microsoft. The micro- did I say the Microsoft? The Microsoft cost $6,000. I swear to God, I do that all the time. <laughs> and IBM computers were almost as, spe- almost as expensive as Macs. And, but regardless of the out-of-reach price, I considered Apple to be the cream of the crop. Everyone wanted a Mac, and everyone knew the guy who made it. And that guy was Steve Jobs. Fast forward to today, and I've, I've had all the iPhones. Mm-hmm. I, I've had iPads, uh, and even this podcast. I mean, even podcasts can be attributed to Steve Jobs to some extent, right? Well, definitely the popularization of, of the medium via iTunes, for example. Right. Were you a nerd back in the 80s, Berto? Oh, yeah. What do, you, what do you remember about your nerddom? My computer nerddom started when my aunt brought us a Radio Shack handheld computer that was essentially a calculator that could do basic and, and had a tiny little memory. It was a really wide calculator with a, a horizontal screen that was fairly wide. I started going through the manual and learning how to write basic programs. I had never done programming, so it was kind of right. like my first exposure. And I fell in love with it instantly. 10, print, dick face, 20, 
go to 10. Exactly. Run program. Yeah, yeah. Dick face, dick face, dick face. That's right. Yeah. That was everyone's first program. Were there computer nerds in Columbia? Yeah. I had a couple of computer nerd buddies in school. And then the next thing my aunt brought down, she kept giving us hand-me-downs. So the next hand-me-down was a Tandy color computer, which was like the Trash 80, but this one had color. Mm-hmm. And it was smaller form factor. Right. Uh, Did it have the reset button on the keyboard? The red one. Yeah. yeah. This was the stupidest design. Yeah. <laughs> right? Okay. So just so you know, people out there, okay, you know your computer keyboard, right? Mm-hmm. It has your QWERTY and your numbers <laughs> and your functions and your number pad and everything. Well, right next to all that was a button <laughs> that literally reset the computer. <laughs> Whoops. So, so if you're typing away and you accidentally hit this button, the computer turns off <laughs> and reboots. And it's like, why would that button need to be on the keyboard? <laughs> Then a few years later, my mom bought me the, the Color Computer 3, which is a more advanced version of that one. Have I seen this computer at your house? You were co- I bought, out of nostalgia, I bought the Color oh. Computer 3 years and years later, obviously. And, and you remembered how to program. Yeah, totally. And you, so you were fun. showing off how to change the color of the screen. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, the 8-bit color. Uh, in fact, fun fact, if anyone's ever seen my Facebook profile pic, it was done in the Color Computer 3. Oh, is that where that comes That's from? That's where that comes from. I thought it was a light bright. It looks like light brights, but it was a little simple program I wrote to make a face. And <laughs> So what's your memory of Steve Jobs? Well, so right at when all this thing is happening, right, I would get all these magazines about computers, and we didn't really have much money. So first of all, as I said, all the computers were coming from my aunt or hand-me-downs and things like that. But I dreamt of having computer, like cooler computers. And I would get the magazines and I was like, oh, the PC Junior and then Tandy 1000 and it was was PC compatible and stuff. But when the Mac came out, oh my gosh. I remember my dad was like, wait, why do you want a Mac? That These things, the screen's small. And I'm like, dad, it looks so cute. It's so beautiful. And he's like, why would you want a computer? Because it looks nice. Like, I don't know, but that's the one I would love to have. And and yeah, that was like, my mom had an Apple IIe. So whenever I would come up to the States to visit her, I was like, oh, even, so I was already in love with Apple, even though I didn't have one, because I liked the IIe. And then when the Mac came out, it was my dream machine. They had one at that computer lab that I was saying. But you couldn't use it. It was like the TA only could use it. Mm-hmm. And he was playing Dark Castle, mm-hmm. the one where you like run with the little dude in the castle and you kind of have to. And the graphics were mind-blowing, even though it was all black and white. But like, yeah. you know, it was mind-blowing. And so, I, yeah, I, I had a deep affection for the Max. And Steve Jobs was like on the news at the time. and Even in Columbia. Even in Columbia, yeah. So today I want to see what we can say about the psychology of Steve Jobs. What do you say? Let's do it. I want to review what we know about his personality, and I want to make some educated guesses about why he was the way that he was. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I am chair of the Couple and Family Therapy Program at Antioch University, Seattle, and I'm also a licensed marriage and family therapist. My name is Humberto Castaneda. I am a repairman for Trash 80s. So before we can comment on his personality, we have to establish what data we're going to use. I'm using interviews with him and interviews with other people in both video and in print. I'm, I'm also using the, the films as source material, so to speak. But as a caveat to all this, we have to say that we can't really provide an accurate analysis of Steve, jo- Steve Jobs because he, I, I haven't interviewed him. I haven't done any testing. I don't have him. He can't defend himself as, I go, right. as we talk about him. And, and he can't say, well, you didn't think about this and you didn't think about that because we're just going off of what the media has chosen to tell us, which is often a distorted view. But I'm trying to see through that distorted view to the real man and see if we can say some things about his psychology. But I have Wikipedia. I know. That's better than the real thing, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. So one thing I really want to say is I I just saw the new Steve Jobs movie with Michael Fassbender. And it portrays perhaps the most brutally honest, you could say, version of his personality. Mm -hmm. And It rubbed a lot of people the wrong way, apparently. Who? Like, Like people that 
like uh, Tim Cook, is it, from Apple, and right. uh, so, John Ivey. And- right, so people that are pro Steve Jobs don't like this movie because it depicts him in a... It, it, he's not like a monster, but it doesn't... It doesn't highlight his the 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 narrative that is usually told about Steve Jobs, particularly in the past, in that he's a g- genius and you know he he can do anything, and because Apple kind of depended on him to be seen in that way because he hit the brand of Apple and Steve Jobs were one thing. Right. And if Steve Jobs was portrayed in a negative light, then Apple is portrayed in a negative light, particularly in the past. I think yeah. today it doesn't really matter anymore. I mean, but in the past, definitely it was that way. And so they would revere Steve Jobs right. in, in a way of branding Apple, you know? But anyway, so you have to ask yourself, was the new movie accurate? You haven't seen it, but you know, just know you've seen a lot of documentaries. It basically just highlights th- his negative side. Right. But it doesn't do it in a terrible way. I When I was watching it, I wasn't like, whoa, this is, this is terrible. You know, it was just trying to be dramatic, you know, about things. And, and really, in the end, it, it sort of redeems him. In the very last 10 seconds, <laughs> it, <laughs> it basically redeems him uh, in, a, in a certain way. But anyway. So, so tell me who kills who. Uh, Bill Gates is blown up by, by Steve Jobs throwing a Macintosh bomb on him, on his head. Is it in the library with a, with, with a, a candlestick? candlestick? Yeah. So was the movie accurate? Well, regarding Sorkin's version, Aaron Sorkin's version, who was the screenplay writer, Wozniak said, Steve Wozniak, oh, by the way, so I asked people around me just, just to get a sense of like, after watching it, so you have to, you know, if you know anything about Apple and Steve Jobs and Wozniak, you know that uh, Steve Jobs was like the business end guy, and Steve Wozniak was the guy who actually made all the products. Yeah, he was the initial genius. <laughs> yeah, and and so I asked people around me. I said, "Have you ever heard of Steve Wozniak?" And all of them were like, "No, who's that?" And I said, "Well, I've heard of Steve Jobs," and they're like, "Oh yeah, of course, Steve Jobs." Yeah. So no one's heard of Wozniak. So Steve Wozniak was the true initial genius. Without yeah. Wozniak, Jobs would be nothing. Nothing. So anyway. And, and, and to be fair, Wozniak on his own probably wouldn't have known what to do with his technology. But he would have made computers, and he yeah. already was, and he probably, he would have been a successful engineer. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. But without without Steve Wozniak, Jobs would have just been an annoying guy, mm-hmm. you know, an annoying hippie. But well, anyway. it, you know, I wonder about that, like, because he might have found other ways to do really interesting stuff but he had a particular genius Mm -hmm. who was his best friend in steve wozniak certainly a a leg up in the world yeah i mean (laughs) if if jobs was was friend i mean say wozniak wasn't around and steve jobs was like oh i want to go out there and find computer guys well he would have had to smooth up to random people and work for you know he he got a job at Atari, Steve Jobs, totally. Anyway, I'll get into yeah. that. But anyway, so Wozniak says that this movie was by far the most accurate depiction of Steve Jobs he's ever seen. Nice. Which says a lot. <laughs> that says a lot. <laughs> Steve Wozniak knows Steve Jobs. Yeah, he, he knew him in a way that, he knew him in a way that drove him away a bit. Right. Steve Wozniak was friends with Steve Jobs in high school. Right. Knew him through the difficult years. Knew him through the Apple years. Knew him throughout his entire life. And Wozniak said, the most accurate depiction of Steve Jobs. Wozniak said the film accurately portrays his negativism Mm -hmm. and the way he didn't care about other people and the way Steve Jobs only cared about himself and the way he didn't seem to have much emotion and how controlling he was and how he failed to listen to others. (laughs) <laughs> and how he didn't care about what other people thought about him and how mean he could be to others yeah. and how he thought that everything he did was right. Wozniak said that Steve Jobs was driven by a thirst for power. Mm-hmm. Wozniak said the movie really conveys what Steve Jobs was really like inside and what it was like to be around him. Uh, he also said, I think Apple goes out of its way to try to enhance his reputation and safeguard the great Steve Jobs. So, you know, this is Wozniak, who was a founder of Apple, and he's, you know, saying, I think Apple tries to brand Steve Jobs in an inaccurate way. Do you think there's a little bit of, better man? Yeah, for sure. I mean, Wozniak is coming from a biased, motivated, reasoning position. But honestly, well, we just have to read that and say, like, well, a person who's very close to him who likes, he likes Steve Jobs and has potentially reasons to pump up Steve Jobs. 
uh, said, wow, the new movie captures yeah. the emotional experience of what it would be like to be with, with Steve Jobs. Right. You know what I mean? Walt, Walt Mossberg came out against the new movie, saying it was inaccurate, though. But let's read a quote by him and, and see if we might be able to say something. He's a journalist. Yeah. Yeah. He said he knew Steve Jobs very well and that the film doesn't portray him accurately. And he provides some interesting quotes. For instance, he says, Yes, we had some shouting matches, but we also had a lot of serious, calm conversations. So right there, it's like, okay. So you think the movie's inaccurate, but you just said you had a lot of shouting matches? But we also had some. (laughs) Some calm conversations. He also says, Steve Jobs wasn't perfect. He was difficult. He was unnecessarily rude and brusque at times. He lied, but he also mellowed and grew as a person. And that mellowing coincided with the best part of his career. Mr. Sorkin opts to hide all of that from his audience. The best of the real Steve Jobs begins to unfold just as Steve Jobs the film ends. So again, even someone who's trying to defend Steve Jobs and saying that the new movie is inaccurate, he says that Steve Jobs was difficult, that he was unnecessarily rude, and that he lied. I mean, this is someone who's defending Steve Jobs right. and at the same time saying he's a liar, he's rude, and difficult as right. a human being. So even the defenders are saying, yeah, that was, the movie's accurate, but he was nice at other times, you know, yeah. just that kind of thing. So, so yeah. Now, if you walk out of the movie thinking, you know, that he was constantly mean to everyone at, at, at every turn, then obviously you know, that's not probably accurate. But but I think it's important to really get a sense of who Steve Jobs was emotionally. And I think the the new movie, according to what I understand, particularly Wozniak's account, is that it provides an accurate f- emotional vibe of what it was like to be around Steve Jobs, particularly in the early years. Make sense? I, I saw a documentary. Is it not a documentary even? It was just raw footage of Next, when he had the Next company, mm-hmm. of them doing product planning. It, it's like a couple hours worth of footage. It's very fascinating because you see, I think you see both sides. You know, you see him, you see people kind of like being deferential to him when they probably should be saying something. But you also see him like inspiring them. But you also see them, you see, I, there's moments where you're like, oh yeah, that seems, I could see the rudeness coming out right there. And this is, he knows he's being filmed, so I don't know. That might even be, but it's one of those like you're, when you're being filmed for long enough and you're interacting with others, you can't help but some of your reality to still come out. And it's it was fascinating. It wasn't done like as a documentary. I think it was they were filming it as part of their internal process. Oh. But then years later, like it it was released for whatever reason. But. All right, so let's go into his history. I read a lot of articles and accounts online of the history of Steve Jobs, and I want to go through it because I think it's important if we're going to analyze his personality, we have to review his history. And he has an interesting past. Right. So his biological father was a political immigrant from Syria. Did you know this? Yeah. Abdul Jindali, who was still alive at the age of 84 and living in Nevada. So he was an illegal immigrant? Uh, was no, he, legal immigrant? he was a legal immigrant, immigrant. but a political... Political, life. meaning he had to leave his country due to pol- political instability and stuff he, like that? He left the Middle East to get away from the political violence I see. that was occurring. For instance, the town he's from, I think, is at you know ground zero of ISIS right now. I Got think. it. Or of the Syrian... I don't know. Some okay. kind of Syrian okay. terribleness. His, his father... So Steve Jobs' biological grandfather was a self-made millionaire, which what? is interesting. Yeah. Huh? So, so Steve Jobs' father was, you know, the son of a millionaire. Did he bring any of that money with him? Well, we'll get into that. Okay. He, so the father, Abdul Jindali, he studied at Columbia University and Wisconsin University, where he obtained a PhD in economics and political science. Abdul Jandali later would work a number of different jobs, which I think is interesting, given the perhaps the ambition that that, mm-hmm. his, that Steve Jobs might have inherited biologically. His Abdul worked as the director of an oil refinery back in Syria. Whoa. The director of an oil 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 refinery. 
He was a professor at Michigan University and Nevada University. Wow. He bought and ran a restaurant in Las Vegas. What? And at age 84, he is currently the vice chairman of the Boomtown Casino and Hotel in Reno, Nevada. Wait, stop. He's alive? Yeah. He's 84, alive, and running a casino. He's vice chairman at a casino in Reno. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. So it seems like, you know, the guy's smart, ambitious, kind of a wanderlust kind of guy. And Steve Jobs might have inherited some of that biologically from his father, right? Yeah. So I kind of want to see his life story. (laughs) Yeah. It's well, he's, yeah, he's an interesting guy. And they depict this in the new film in that Steve Jobs actually said that he secretly met his father because he, he knew his father worked at a restaurant actually, I think nearby where Steve Jobs lived in the eighties or nineties. And he ate at his, at his restaurant and met his father and knew that it was his father, but didn't introduce himself. And so his father was serving him <laughs> at the restaurant and didn't know that Steve, and knew Steve Jobs, who Steve Jobs was, but didn't know Steve Jobs was his biological son. Oh, whoa. Yeah, yeah he didn't find out until a lot later. I, see, I knew that, but I, I didn't know that that's, like, that would be wild. Yeah. Like, that's actually a little, it's almost creepy, you know? <laughs> but, it's kind of like stalking. Yeah, your, but I guess you, you know, get father. to do that when you're, trying to find your biological father. Yeah. So Abdul in West, Wisconsin, so this is earlier in yeah. his life, he dated a German-Swiss Catholic called Joanne Schiebel. Her name was Joanne Schiebel. She became pregnant. Abdul and Joanne became pregnant. They tried to get married, but her father refused to allow her to marry him because he was a Muslim. <laughs> Joanne Schiebel apparently didn't involve Abdul Jindali in the pregnancy, she was ashamed, I think. She went to San Francisco to have the baby without telling anyone, and she put the baby up for adoption. Luckily, luckily since then, we've overcome all these biases against Muslims and other races. Totally. Joanne Schiebel wanted him to be, a, Steve Jobs, wanted him to be adopted by a Catholic, well-educated, and wealthy couple. And when Paul and Clara Jobs adopted Steve Jobs, Schiebel found out that they didn't have a college education, and Shebel refused to sign the adoption papers. This is an important thing in the psychology of Steve Jobs. Hmm. So the biological mother, Joanne Shebel, took Paul and Clara Jobs to court while Steve Jobs was in the care of Paul and Clara. Okay. How old was he? He was, you know, zero to one. Oh, right? okay. So really little. Yeah. Okay. So he's an infant. And during this time, while the, the biological mother was taking the adoptive parents to court, Steve Jobs once said about his adoptive mother, this is his words, he said that his mother was too frightened to love him for the first six months of his life because she was scared they were going to take her son away oh. from her. This likely resulted in an attachment injury to Steve Oof. Jobs. This is, this is the primary problem w- that presented itself to Steve Jobs' development. Oh, my God. During the, fi- the first six months of your life, you are in need of a tremendous amount of emotional and physical warmth, what we would call loving a child, yeah. holding them, talking to them, interacting facially, uh, verbally, attending to their needs. They're basically like appendages of the parents, you know? The baby is always next to you and is always needing something and is, and is fussy and needs to be wiped and cleaned. And <laughs> e- Babies need a tremendous <clears throat> amount of attention because they, in, and, and they interpret the lack of that in a particular way. When they're not attended to and their distress goes up, this has a detrimental effect on brain development, particularly regarding attachment, the limbic system, emotional regulation, and these kinds of things. Is this why um, in the legend of Greystoke, he kind of goes nuts and starts chopping people's heads off? Uh, you're talking about Tarzan being left in the woods. Yeah. But he was taken care of by... Wolves? No, by... Oh, by, the monkeys, by, the, the gorillas. By gorillas, yeah. by apes, or chimps or gorillas. I'm kind of confusing the jungle book where he's taken care of by wolves. You're messing all sorts of shit up. So this, this event provides me as an outsider with a key data point in analyzing Steve Jobs' 
personality, which I'll get into later. But this is this is an important thing, and it's something that some people that a lot of people don't understand. People who understand attachment understand this very well. But people who don't understand attachment think, well, you know, three month old baby even remember that. Yeah, he doesn't remember it. You know, as long as the baby is is healthy, who cares, right? right? But the brain is developing even in utero in relation to these yeah. kinds of things. And, and it, you know, and as a clinician, I can tell you that a lot of times I'll be talking with someone and they'll exhibit these attachment problems. And then I'll later find out that they were adopted and that they were adopted a little later than, than day one. If you're adopted day one, then the attachment injury is actually quite minimal. There's an attachment injury that happens later once you find out that you're <clears throat> adopted, which, oh, wow. which, which can hurt some people. But it's not on a neurological level. It's more on a, on a life story level. Like, you, you mean my life story is not the way I thought it was? It, it's a difficulty in that way. But when you, when you neglect a child, an infant, that actually rewires their brain literally. Do you know if it's better to tell the child sooner or later about being adopted? There's research on that. And, and it's, it's less of when and how and more of a function of how, how and also how the child perceives it. Because if a child perceives it as, well, it's just a normal thing. Kids get adopted, no big deal. I have, I have parents who loved me, but also gave me to my, my real parents, which are my adoptive parents who also love me and everything is fine. Whereas if you hide it from a child and then they find out and it's shameful and everyone's ashamed because they're trying to keep it a secret you know, it's a much different experience for a child. I see. I was thinking more like they come home from school one day, the lights are off. When they walk in, <laughs> surprise. they go, surprise, you're adopted. And everyone points and laughs. <laughs> yeah. It's like carry the movie. <laughs> okay. But Shebel, the, the biological mother, later consented to releasing the baby to Paul and Clara Jobs after they promised that they would send him to college. Their adoptive mother said, this is Clara, she said, even after we won the case, Steve Jobs was so difficult a child that by the time he was two, I felt we had made a mistake. Huh? And I wanted to return him. What? Yeah. You have got to be kidding me. No. So again, there was some issues regarding attachment and attunement with Steve Jobs as a child. So even after she accepted the baby wow. Steve into her life, he was so difficult as a child that it made it difficult for them to parent him and, and also furthered the attachment disruption. That's such a bizarre statement, though, because that's, they're just describing a baby. Babies are difficult. But I've heard this from many, many parents. Uh -huh. the, 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 the thing is this, and I've, as a therapist, for whatever reason, I've come across a lot of adoptive families. Uh -huh. And there's some weird thing, and I don't know if it's biological or it's cultural or whatever, but when it's your, when it's the fruit of your loins and the child is difficult, you will frame it in a particular way. You know, you'll be much more tolerant and patient. But if you were given this baby kind of randomly by society and you sort of just got the luck of the draw of a difficult baby, the tendency is to not be as patient or tolerant and therefore adopted children in general, in my anecdotal experience, tend to get the short end of the stick when it comes to patience. It's unfortunate, but yeah. So Steve Jobs once said, knowing I was adopted may have made me feel more independent, but I have never felt abandoned. He was sure to never make it seem like his adoptive parents were deficient in any way. So here we say that he felt independent, but not abandoned. This is indicative of what we call a, a dismissive attachment style in parenting. When you raise children in a, in a neglecting way, the children tend to learn to be very independent because at an early age, they realize that they're basically alone and they have to figure stuff out on their own. Right. So more evidence of at least some emotional neglect from his parents. Now, maybe Steve Jobs was a very difficult baby, and there are some babies who are born extremely difficult for one reason or another, and that can make parenting difficult. And sure. it's not the parent's fault, per se, that it might be hard to 
love and be motivated to right. care for a child that is constantly crying and yeah Oof. right whereas if you have a very easygoing baby it makes parenting very easy you know mm-hmm. he also said i've always felt special my parents made me feel special mm. so here we see the beginning of the data in the direction of narcissism in that it was taught to him and that his parents perhaps out of a feeling of guilt because a lot of parental uh shall we say specialness narcissism parenting style a lot of that comes from when parents feel guilty for something so it's possible that the parents felt guilty for something maybe they didn't pay him enough attention when he was a baby or something but regardless he said that they made him feel very special and that their research shows when parents fill a child's head with a lot of messages of you're special, you're different, you're better than other people, that that actually can create narcissism in a, in a child when they grow up to be an adult. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Did your parents make you feel special? Uh, Cause you're kind of narcissistic. No, 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 no. I just, that I was special. <laughs> so they had no choice but to accept it and acknowledge it. <laughs> <laughs> Later, his biological parents were married and the parents, he, you know, he didn't, he right. wasn't raised by. His biological parents were married and they had a daughter, Mona, who went on to become a very successful American no- oh. novelist. Wait, wait, wait. His, his uh, biological parents got back together? Right. Oh, and whoa, had, that's painful. And had a daughter, Mona, who became a successful American novelist. I think her name's Mona Simpson. What? Yeah. So again, more evidence of a biological right. intelligence and ambition. Jobs' father, his adoptive father, Paul Jobs, was the son of an alcoholic and abusive father. So Steve Jobs was raised by a father who was abused by, mm. as a child, by an, an alcoholic father. And this, you know, is likely uh, linked to the way that Steve Jobs' father raised him, himself, right? As a hobby, Paul Jobs rebuilt cars, which is where Steve Jobs got a lot of his interest in design and this kind of thing. And as a career, he was a repo man. He was apparently very aggressive and tough. So Steve Jobs' dad was was very aggressive and tough. And we can go into like the Freudian psychoanalysis of this in sure. terms of you're raised in a family with a very manly man mm-hmm. and you can't compete with that. And perhaps that led to lower self-esteem and a desire for power somehow, some way. You know what I mean? But I'm sort of stretching there. There's, sure. there's not a lot of data regarding that one. And then Paul Jobs died in 1993. Clara Jobs, Steve Jobs' mother, was the daughter of Armenian immigrants. She grew up in San Francisco and had been married before, but her husband had been killed in World War II. And due to medical problems preventing her from being pregnant, they decided to adopt, and they adopted two children. All right, so let's go into uh, Steve Jobs' childhood. As a child, Steve Jobs had difficulty making friends with children his own age, and he was seen by his classmates as being a loner. Uh, I did know that part. Oh, by the way, I should point out, I, I've read me, uh, at least two or three books about Jobs, and I've watched many things, and they never go into all these details about his, like his really young stuff. It always starts in like high school. Right. Which is fascinating. To right, me. because people in general ignore the fact that personality is affected yeah. by, by early childhood. Totally. And to me, at this point in the story, as we start to go into his chi- into his later childhood, we're only looking at the result yeah. of what happened to him in his first five years of life. That's right. So So yeah, I had read that he was kind of a loner. <laughs> right. But you didn't know that, you know, he was neglected as a child and yeah. his parents, you know, blah, right. blah, blah. Anyway. So Job ha- Jobs had difficulty functioning at school. He resisted authority figures. He frequently misbehaved. And he was suspended from school a few times. Steve Jobs stated that he was pretty bored in school and had turned into a little terror, he said. That's a quote, a little terror. Mm-hmm. He said, you should have seen us in the third grade. We basically destroyed the teacher. Right. He frequently p- played pranks on other people. However, his father never, never reprimanded him. Instead, he blamed the school instead for not challenging his son. 
So, wow, that's a message to take with you. Right. So there you are, Steve Jobs being a terror, as Steve Jobs Self-described. puts it. described <laughs> Destroying a teacher. And then your parents come in and defend you and actually attack the school. So not only are you super special, but everything you do is right, right. and justified <laughs> and approved of by the two people you care about the most, which is your parents. Yeah. So what do you take away from that? <laughs> Steve Jobs skipped the fifth grade and transferred to the sixth grade. More fuel for his narcissism, right? Yep. And more social isolation. Research shows that when you skip children to another grade, although that might help their academic performance, maybe sometimes, but it actually is detrimental to them overall because they're in a group of kids who are ahead of them in terms of maturation and who might isolate him away because he's the young kid, you know, he, he's, he's a reject. And so, but, but Doogie Hauser had a good solid group of friends. One was like an architect. The other one was a news reporter gal. But then he later grew up and didn't you see him in Harold and Kumar? Oh, you're right. He had really developed you're into right. a, quite, <laughs> quite a interesting guy. Quite a terror. Yeah. Again, more accounts of him being a socially awkward loner. So this is probably horrible for him. Yeah. I mean, at a time in your life when all you want to do is play with your friends and this sort of thing, he was awkward and lonely and isolated. And he was often bullied, which led him to giving his parents an ultimatum. They had to let him transfer schools or he would drop out. This is like in junior high or something. And he's like, parents, if you don't transfer me to another school, I'm going to drop out of school. And although his, you can just take a guess what they decided to do. Uh, they gave in to his demands. Yeah, but how? Oh, wait. So let's see. He said, if in you order for him to transfer me, well, in order for him to out. transfer schools, you have to live. Oh, the, they moved. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So even though his family was not wealthy at all, I mean, yeah. the dad was a repo man for crying out loud, they used all of their savings to buy a new home so he could attend a different school. Right, right. So more narcissism and more social isolation and more justification for his. his bullying behavior. A childhood friend said that for some reason, the kids in the eighth grade didn't like Steve Jobs because they thought he was odd. In mid-1968, when Steve Jobs was 13, he was given a summer job by Bill Hewlett of Hewlett Packard, working for Hewlett Packard. He was on an assembly line making gadgets, and he loved this job. Jobs was still a loner during this time in high school. By, by the way, I'll, I'll point out that Right place, right place, right time is so important sometimes in right. life. Because <laughs> he was right there in Silicon Valley. And think about that. Like, who, who's like, ah, my summer job at Hewlett Packard, you know, right. at, like, at that age. Right, like, exactly. <laughs> he then underwent a change during the mid-70s. He said, I got stoned for the first time. I discovered Shakespeare, Dylan Thomas. I read Moby Dick and went back as a junior in high school taking creative writing classes. So this is something that I often see in teens that I treat in that pot often takes away the pain of being a teen. It also gives you friends because you smoke pot in isolation with other teenagers. You need other friends to smoke pot because you need them to get it for you. It's sometimes a good idea to be together so one could be a lookout. Right. And, And so pot gave him not only a medication to take away the pain, but also instant friends. His best friends at the time in high school were Steve Wozniak and his first girlfriend, artistic Chris Ann Brennan. She was an artistic person, Chris Ann. After high school, Steve Jobs enrolled in Reed College in Portland, Oregon. Again, even though his parents weren't wealthy, they drained their life savings to pay for the high tuition at Reed College. He was still involved romantically with Chris Ann Brennan, but, or Brennan? Brennan or Brennan? Yeah, you and your last names today. Brennan, I think. (laughs) But their, Good relationship, sure. Good <laughs> sure. but their relationship was starting to grow distant in college. He tried to get her to move in with him, but she, but she refused. He kept his relationship with her going, even though it was not going well. I've seen this with attachment d- uh, injured people in that they will have long relationships with people off and on because they have difficulty managing the emotional give and take of a relationship, but they also are desperate for closeness 
and dedication from someone and consistency. And so they might be in a very long-term dysfunctional relationship. And I think there's some evidence of that in that Chris Ann was Steve Jobs' high school girlfriend. Right. And they were involved with each other off and on in sort of a dysfunctional way for the rest of his life. Wow. In one way. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because she ended up having a kid, but I'll get into that in a second. So in 1972, Steve Wozniak designed his, his own version of the classic video game Pong. After finishing it, Wozniak gave the board, the computer board, to Jobs, who then took it to Atari. Atari thought that Steve Jobs had built it. I don't know why they would have thought that. And gave him a job as a technician. So here we have the first documented example of how he's a liar and how he craps on his best friends, Steve, Wo- Steve Wozniak. But by the way, the, um, I've, that story has been told in a few different ways because in, in, in at least one version, he already had some sort of employment or contract work or something with Atari and he was challenged to like um, to do something like come up with a game or something like that. And then that's when he went and tapped on, on Steve Wozniak and he presented it as, a, as his own. But I think in his mind, he wasn't presenting it as, a, as his own. As his, as, it wasn't just that he was stealing the idea, but he was being smart about subcontracting. You know what I mean? Like the, the self story was like, no, I'm not stealing. I'm just I'm subcontracting. You know, yeah, a little squishy though. <laughs> yeah, of course, very squishy. It gets worse in the next story I'll tell about that. But anyway, Atari's co-founder later described Steve Jobs as difficult but valuable, pointing out that he was very often the smartest guy in the room, and he would let people know that he was the smartest <laughs> guy in the room. This is Nolan Bush Bushnell. I don't know. I forget. Yeah. It was during this time that Steve Jobs got really into Eastern religion and meditation. At Atari, they offered Steve Jobs $100 for each TTL chip that was eliminated in a particular machine. Do you know what a TTL chip is? They're integrated circuits, right? And they're trying to reduce the number of components that they need to have for the same output, right? The same. So like, if you're like, oh, you know what? We can use, we can optimize by using the same chip over here for two things. Right. Now we can eliminate this one over here. Uh-huh. And that was kind of the, the basic idea. Okay. So since Steve Jobs knew very little about this sort of thing, he made a deal with Wozniak to split the fee evenly if Wozniak could minimize the number of chips. Wozniak amazingly reduced, because he's a genius, the TTL chip count from 40 to 46 from some, from some other high number. Yeah. And Atari gave Steve Jobs $5,000. So it's, I guess that'd be 50. He reduced it by 50 chips for like half the amount of chips. And Atari gives Steve Jobs, here's $5,000 because you win the prize. <laughs> but Jobs told Wozniak that Atari paid him only $700. And so he only paid Wozniak three hundred and fifty dollars split it evenly hey it's fair this is this is like i don't this is stuff out of some sort of evil story i what am i trying to say this is like if someone told a story about an asshole a fictional story this would be the story you know what i mean yeah because it's like there's so many ways in which you you could have done the same thing but not quite as egregious yeah like you could have said look in all in all cases it's wrong right he should have just said hey we got paid 5000 And even though I didn't do shit because I found us the work, I'm going to take half. Yeah. And you could still poke holes at that, but that would have been like the minimum, right? He could have said, they paid us 2000 Here's most of it for you. Yeah. No, he's like under 1000 and we're going to split it evenly. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, you, yeah, right. You, you could argue that Wozniak deserved all the five grand. One. Yes. <laughs> finder's and, fee, like a finder's fee would have been like 10%. Right. So, so, so Wozniak was, you know, he, he deserved $5,000 right. and got paid $350 because Steve Jobs is an asshole. That, that's a total dick move. Yeah, yeah. Again, if this was, if Wozniak was some rando dude down the street that Steve Jobs was playing a prank on just to screw him over, that's one thing. It's his friend. But Steve Wozniak is his best buddy. 
They it's, basically live together at this point. It, it's an antisocial move. You it's know, it's terrible. Like, Can you imagine if your friend did that to you? Especially back then when you're totally poor. Three hundred the difference between twenty five hundred dollars and three hundred and fifty dollars is a is like tremendous, especially course. in dollars back then, right? Also think about the expectation that was set up in Wozniak's mind about his self worth at that point. Right. Like, oh, okay. My skills are worth three hundred and fifty dollars. Not knowing he could be demanding a premium right. for his skills. Right, exactly. Wozniak later designed something they called the blue box. This blue box allowed them to make free long distance calls. Jobs told Jobs told Wozniak to make more so they could sell these illegal boxes for money. This is an example of Steve Jobs' anti authority. Uh, streak, right? In 1976, Wozniak invented the Apple I computer. Wozniak showed it to Jobs, and this is an important thing to know. <laughs> Wozniak showed the Apple computer to Steve Jobs. Jobs suggested that they sell it. So they formed Apple Computer and worked out of the garage in Steve Jobs' parents' home. And that home is now a, an historic site in, is, right. it in, is it in Mountain View or? It must be. It's right, nearby right. San there. Jose, I think. Oh, by, by the way, uh, Clearly, Steve Jobs did something for Wozniak emotionally that Wozniak felt he could trust him and that he, that he was, you know, a positive addition to himself, to his life. Right. Um, I wonder if it's part of that, that other flip side of his psychology that he could be very engaging when he wanted to be or, you know, right. very uh, enthusiastic and maybe that... Right. That rubbed off on Wozniak. Right. I mean, from the movies I've seen depicting this early phase, and who knows if it's accurate, but it, it seems possible yeah. that Wozniak is just a nerd who just likes to build stuff. He is a scientist. Yeah. He is in his lab building and, shit. And, he would, and he's just one of the, those guys who just likes to do that kind of thing. That's right. And doesn't have a lot of aspirations or ambitions or has minor aspirations. You know, like, ooh, wouldn't it be cool if I designed this thing that could do this thing and impress my friends? It was a little bit of like yeah. the blue box thing. They're like, ooh, we could impress our friends this way. It, what, but Steve Jobs was like, I'm going to change the world. I mean, he literally early on had this vision of changing the face of the planet with his mind. Do you yeah, know what I mean? I right. mean, so you match that up with Wozniak and his genius back then, and you get, you know, the early Apple computers. Okay, so at this time, Steve Jobs got back together with Chris Ann Brennan, and then in 1977, Jobs and Wozniak, oh, oh yeah, Jobs and Wozniak introduced the Apple II at the West Coast Computer Fair. The Apple II is an 8-bit, is an 8-bit, home computer. It was the first consumer product sold by Apple Computer and was one of the first highly successful mass-produced microcomputer products. It was designed primarily by Steve Wozniak and a few other guys, but not Steve Jobs. <laughs> Again, Steve Jobs was the, was the marketer and yeah. the, the guy who was setting this all up. And, and by the way, and, and this is not to say that you need all the negative components of his personality, but I will say that there is something about that type of personality that is able to say with a straight face, I'm going to grab this idea that nine out of 10 people would not understand why it's even a thing, and I'm gonna go sell it. And with that, we're gonna make it a better one, and then eventually we're gonna change the world. It, it's weird, because you kind of have to be crazy right. to, to buy yourself into that bullshit. Right. Yeah. And my thought on that is for every Steve Jobs, there's a million other guys that are ranting and raving to nobody. Yeah. They, they're narcissistic and have, you know, delusions of grandeur yeah. and amount to nothing. Yeah. But, but it, so it's it, sufficient. It's, it's sorry. It's necessary, but not sufficient. Right. In some, it not, and it's not always necessary, but I think that for certain kind of radical bets, you need to be a little radical yourself right. to even embark on the bet. Yeah. And I'll just admit, I'm a little bit this way. Yeah. I, starting a podcast is a completely irrational endeavor. Right. When we first started this thing, I had no idea what I was doing. I had no idea where it was headed. I had no idea what I was going to do. I, I did random things. But, I, inv yeah. I involved a whole team of people, you and Lita and computer or uh, camera guys. You involved and, computers? <laughs> I involved all sorts of guests. And, well, you used me because I had made those microphones out of, <laughs> out of thin air, remember? Yeah. You were my Wozniak. Yeah. <laughs> and so, but it took 
a bit of irrational confidence. This yeah. like, I can compete with <laughs> the others, you know, on, yeah. on the internet. This, this belief like, I can, if they can do it, I can do it, right. you know. And most people don't have that. Most people would say, well, what could I do that could compete with what's already out there? Yeah. And, and this is true, I think, in both of our lives, right? To, yep. to be a musician, you have to somewhat have that element of hubris. That's right. And, like, I repair trash 80s. Trust me. No one thinks that's a good idea. <laughs> so, Brennan eventually took a position at Apple in the shipping department and was offered a design job, by a design internship by Steve Jobs and other people. But Chris Ann Brennan's relationship with Jobs began to decline as his position in Apple grew, and she began to consider ending the relationship. But they were on and off again all the time, so mm-hmm. God knows. And, and by now, it's probably, what, like 10 years later or something? Yeah, probably. But then she became pregnant. She told him she became pregnant, and he was not happy about it. Oh, man. He refused to discuss the pregnancy with her. Brennan felt confused about what to do. Jobs wanted to take... Jobs wanted her to take the design job, but she refused to take it because she was ashamed of being pregnant in a professional environment. Oh. And she was ashamed that everyone would know that Steve Jobs was the father. Whoa. Because, you know, it's like you're a, yeah, it's you're a, a junior employee and the CEO impregnates you and you're sort of on and off with right. this guy. Apple was probably like 200 employees at that point. Yeah. Uh, Brennan turned down the position and quit Apple altogether. She said that Jobs told her, if you give up this baby for adoption, you will be sorry. And he also said, I am never going to help you with, wait. with this baby. Wait, 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 wait. That's so bizarre. It's like so contradictory, right? Like, listen, if you give this baby up for adoption, you're, you're, you're going to be sorry. You're crazy if you do that. But at the same time, I'm going to offer no assistance. Right. So, that sounds very Republican. <laughs> <laughs> and this, the issue here is that when a wound of yours is touched upon, you tend to act in strange ways. So Jobs probably was a little resentful, if not a lot resentful, of his biological parents yeah. ad- uh, giving him up for adoption. There's some evidence of that. And, and both, both aspects come out to play. On the one hand, he's like, don't ever give someone up for adoption, right? right, right. And on the other hand, but I definitely have no emotion in my body to care for an infant. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Because he internalized that message that you're not worth it as a yeah. baby, he then in turn made his own future baby Be feel worth it. feel worthless. Yeah. yeah. During her pregnancy, Steve Jobs started to tell people that she slept around and that she was and that he was infertile, which meant that he couldn't be the the father of the child. Jesus. And they ended their their romantic relationship forever at this point. Hey, think of how how sociopathic that is. Oh, her? She, first of all, she's a slut. Second, I'm infertile. Right. Like that's that's uh that's a level of lying that's so <laughs> egregious, you know. I know. And the thing is, is at this point, he's to some extent a public figure. Yeah. And he's got to know that this could come back around. Well, there's no internet, though. But <laughs> anyway. it's, like, it's like things only get printed when you have like that interview with Forbes or something. Oh, in time. No, he was in time. Yeah, what I mean is, you know, you have to have a, an interview with some publication. Yeah. Otherwise, no one knows anything about you. Well, and he was in time and he said yeah. some horrible shit. <laughs> At the time, Brennan was on welfare, and she was cleaning houses to earn money. She would sometimes ask Jobs for money, but he always refused. In 1978, when Steve Jobs was 23, Brennan gave birth to her baby, Lisa Brennan. So Steve Jobs was 23, which is the same age that when his biological parents put him up for adoption. So just a little... little. Oh, wow. Yeah. And what, uh, what year was this? 78. Brennan suggested the name Lisa, and Steve Jobs also liked the name Lisa. He began to publicly deny that he was the father, though. Steve Jobs named his first. What, Steve Jobs named one of his first computers after Lisa, but he lied and said it was a local, <laughs> a local integrated software architecture, <laughs> which is a meaningless phrase. And he actually eventually admitted that. Do you, have you watched Silicon Valley? Yeah. It's like one of those little, you yeah. know, 
Cooley bits, integrated architecture. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Steve Jobs later admitted that obviously the computer was named after my daughter. <laughs> it's like Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Yeah. No, 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 no. It's just a drawing my daughter made. <laughs> The Lisa computer was the first personal computer to offer a graphical user interface in a machine aimed at individual business users. The Lisa sold poorly with only 100,000 units selling. <laughs> Wasn't it like four grand or something? It was like so... And that was even earlier than the Mac. That was right. crazy. In 1982, after Jobs was forced out of the Lisa project, he joined the Macintosh project. At this point, Steve Jobs uh, provided a DNA test and it, pro it approved that he was Lisa's father. And he was required to give Brennan $385 a month in addition to returning the money she had received from welfare. By, by the way, that also shows something about his psychology. He knew damn well, deep down inside, that he was the father, right? right. But he went through all the steps to get a DNA test because it was probably mandated. Like, don't you, th like, you would think a normal person would at some point go like, listen, 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 I am the father, right? Like, I, I like, why go through all that circus? But he had kind of like convinced himself that he wasn't the father. Right. So he gives her $500 a month, which is more than the 385 but Jobs at the time was a millionaire. And a little bit later, uh, the, the, next late, the next year later, he was worth $10 million. And then next year later, when he was 25, he was worth $100, 100 million. million. During that time, Brennan worked as a waitress in Palo Alto. In 1984, Apple introduced the Macintosh, which was based on the Lisa and the Xerox mouse-based mouse interface. The Macintosh was introduced by a $1.5 million Ridley Scott television commercial titled 1984. Yep. Do you remember this commercial? I never saw it live because in Colombia they didn't really broadcast it, yeah. but I've seen it since. I remember the commercial. It was a very big deal. It was played during the Super oh, Bowl. Oh, I can imagine. Oh, yeah. that's the other reason because football, uh, American, American football, football would never be shown down there. The commercial was called a masterpiece, which is ridiculous if you've seen it in, with our contemporary eyes. It's a total stupid commercial, but at the time... You didn't spend the sort of money you do today on commercials. I mean, today, right. you know, especially Super Bowl commercials, are basically like mini films. They're yeah. like mini cinematic adventures, you know? But the symbolism was, in fact, masterful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because, because it, was, it was essentially, it was making like this overly stated point about everything is going to change. We're demolishing the big blue. We're like, everything right. is over. Right. This new world is coming. Right. The symbol was that that IBM had changed all of us into drones right. by and boring. Mm -hmm. And then, and then Apple comes along with this, a, f a female, yeah. first of all, she's <laughs> a beautiful Olympic, Olympic style, Olympic yeah. athlete, female. And she throws a hammer through big brother's face. Right. And know? there's a little bit of Russian, anti-Russian symbolism thrown in. Which is kind of weird because the woman almost looks like Russian. Yes, yeah, she does. You know, and the hammer is a, a Russian, part of the Russian symbol, right. hammering the sickle. But again, Ridley Scott directed this. I know. <laughs> That's crazy. At Apple's annual shareholders meeting, Jobs introduced the Macintosh to a, widely, a wildly enthusiastic audience. Apparently, people were going crazy. But the Mac was way too expensive, yeah. and Microsoft and IBM started making much cheaper machines with <laughs> similar interfaces. In 1985, after fighting with the board of directors, the board decided to put him in charge of, quote-unquote, new product development, which, which effectively made Steve Jobs powerless at Apple. They were sick and tired of his bullshit, and Steve Jobs quit Apple. So then he starts his own project called Next, and some Apple employees left Apple and joined Steve Jobs in his next venture called Next. A year later, he was running out of money. And do you know the famous billionaire who decided to invest in Next? Do you know who that was? Um, I don't know. I forget. He ran for president in 19... Oh, yeah, Ross Perot. That's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is bizarre. Ross Perot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In 1988, Steve Jobs unveiled the Next computer in a lavish and exclusive event. This is depicted in the new Steve Jobs movie. There, there, there's actually, I've seen footage of Ross Perot talking about Steve Jobs in at least one of those documentaries. <laughs> the Next workstations were first released in 1990, and they were priced at, how much do you think? 
uh, ten grand. Exactly, ten thousand dollars, which is about nineteen thousand dollars in today's dollars. <laughs> By the way, they looked neat. It was like black, and it yeah. was neat. Oh. Can you imagine a computer <laughs> costing nineteen grand? <laughs> yes, but it's the kind of thing they they do today, which got like custom built, and it has like sixteen. Get, uh, video cards and all this bullshit. That would still be expensive. <laughs> yeah. Like like the Apple Lisa, the next workstation was technologically advanced, but was largely dismissed as cost prohibitive by the educational sector for which it was designed. Yeah. Tim Berners Lee invented the World Wide Web on a next computer at CERN. Did you know that? Yes. I, I mean, like the next, it was an awesome system, but like, yeah, like no, the, they could afford it, <laughs> you know, like right. CERN could afford it. <laughs> right. I mean, if your purpose was to design very specialized computers for a select few people, then you, you succeeded. Yeah. But that wasn't his, his. But it's like, you have to know the market. Like, you remember the Silicon Graphics workstations? That's how, where... Okay, so SGI was how they used to do all the 3D rendering back in like the 90s. You know, um, a Silicon Graphics workstation cost, you know, probably ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000. And it was this super dedicated beast of hardware. But they knew their market. Their market was to, to make the most advanced 3D graphics at the time. Right. And it was a very niche thing. But, right. you know, you didn't have to sell that many systems. Right. It's sort of be like... If you designed a Tesla, like a the brand new Tesla, yeah, right, and you were hoping that it would sell to every American, but that's not how Tesla did it. They said, obviously, we're designing a very expensive car yeah. for a very select few people. Right. Therefore, our price is going to have to be very high, and we're going to have to plan for production of very few, very few cars. Right. But that's not Steve. Steve Jobs has always been about the mass market. He's never been, oh, I just want to sell a few few right. things to a few people. But he hadn't learned. See, now, notice it took him twice. Twice the same, actually three times. He made the same mistake three times before he finally kind of Lisa, learned. Lisa, Macintosh, yeah. and now Next. Right. Yeah, and, and then he finally must have, the third time was the charm, I think. Yeah. <laughs> To not, not, not that the third time worked, but the third time was the, the charm to learn the lesson. <laughs> so Next was eventually acquired by Apple in 1997, but I'll get more into that later. I mean, why do you think it took him so long to learn that lesson? Wait. And was it a lesson he learned or was it know. a reality of the market? I, I don't know, because like in all honesty, it, the, the weirdest thing is like the Apple II, you would have thought, oh, they know the lesson. Because the reason the Apple II did so well is because it was, it was at a great price point. It didn't try to do too many things. It did a. It did what it did really well. It was simple to use. It was, like, I. It's bizarre actually that he didn't retain that less. In fact, um, in one of the movies and one of the books, I remember a lot, a lot about how Apple II was still very viable and making ton of money. Yeah. And the team that did the Apple IIe and the Apple, at least the IIe, if not the IIg as well, they still made a ton of money with those. Right. You know, those were selling well into, like, I remember. My like the two E was my mom had a two E and the two G was selling into like eighty nine. Right. I think they were still selling two Gs. Like those were very successful computers. Yeah. I feel like everyone had a two E. You know. Yeah. Those those were like. And every school, yeah. if they didn't have the tandies, the trashes, they had right. Apple two Es, and eventually they had Apple two Es. Well, I think it's possible that he just really wanted something but didn't think about the reality of the situation and just figured that it would work out. Yeah. You know? Like he just like, okay, I want to make the perfect computer, which is awesome, you know, and, and he kind of did, but he didn't think about the reality of production yeah. and the reality of the marketplace. He, he made, it's like he thought without thinking about what people will actually spend their money on. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. And then, but by the time the iMac comes out, I think the, the production was at such a place in terms of the industry that they could give him his perfect computer at a much lower price. Well, and keep in mind, remember the colorful iMacs, like the yeah. blue candy shells, right? Yeah. Those were actually not high end right so somehow either through all those lessons or whatever he came back around to what's valuable to people 
isn't the best hardware in the world. Right. It's something aesthetically pleasing, which was true about Apple IIe and Mac, but also affordable. Right. And because like the the the, the iMacs, it, it was nowhere near the best hardware around. Yeah. I think part there's some evidence that as he matured, he started to actually develop some empathy, more more empathy, shall we say? Mm-hmm. I mean, he eventually he was married with children and yeah. they, they seemed to love him and all. So, you know, I think he he eventually matured, but I think it took him a lot of humiliations yeah. to really reflect on himself and start to listen to other people and, and in part listen to the marketplace right. that they just don't want to... S- I think in his mind, he's like, well, obviously when they see how awesome this is, they're going to want to spend $19,000 because it's going to be so great because yeah. I love this thing. And of course, everyone else is going to love it. And you have an extra 19 grand or you could you have a credit card. You're going to love this thing you know, without thinking like, well, they're not... I'm I'm not that great. Do you know what I mean? I, I'm not that awesome. I'm not oh, as and, awesome as I think and, I am. And even... Like, hey, listen, a Ferrari is awesome, but how many people can can buy one? Like, <laughs> well, it could be argued that we could all buy a Ferrari, but we wouldn't have a house. Uh, yeah, exactly. Or sure. any food. Hey, that's a good point. We should all buy a Ferrari. Just just a Ferrari. They don't even have that many Ferraris. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's go back to '86 when Steve Jobs became a major funder <gasps> of an early version of Pixar. Dude, hold on. Pause. You know what we should do? What for real? Let's get a group of us together Buy and, and like share. Timeshare a Ferrari. <laughs> How come they don't do that more often? We should totally do it. We could get for like, you know, like, okay, I'll get it this Friday and you can get it Saturday. No, I'm starting a timeshare company for vehicles. <laughs> like super awesome vehicles? Yeah. Huh. You buy, you sell, instead of selling a Ferrari, I sell you a week. <laughs> You know, like but the timeshare, the, the it, condos. You know, you're basically just talking about a car rental company. It's a rental company. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Steve Jobs, you are not, my friend. <laughs> no, because while your week is, well, you have it for your week, you get to decorate it. You get to say it's yours. <laughs> but it better be clean as a whistle come Sunday. Yeah. So back in 1986, Steve Jobs became a major funder of an early version of Pixar. You know, it's further, it's further evidence that Steve Jobs was on the cutting edge of everything, right? The first film that they made was Toy Story in 1995, which was nine years later. With, and Steve Jobs was credited as an executive producer of Toy Story. Did you know that? Yeah. I had no idea that Steve Jobs was listed as an executive producer of Toy Story. That's nuts. Yeah. In 2006, nine years, or 11 years after Toy Story, Disney agreed to purchase Pixar for $7.5 billion. When the deal was closed, Jobs became Disney's largest single shareholder with 7% of the company's stock. It's crazy. <laughs> like one of the family members of Disney, like, you know, so-and-so Disney only had like 1% of the stock. Yeah. And then you go to the next person, it's Steve Jobs. It's crazy. Like this guy's life. It's nuts, right? All right, so let's get back to Chris Ann Brennan here. So Chris Ann Brennan notes that after Jobs was forced out of Apple, so this is when he was fired and went on to Next, he apologized, Steve Jobs apologized many times to Chris Ann Brennan over his behavior towards Lisa and towards her. She also states that Steve Jobs said he never took responsibility for Lisa when he should have and that he was very sorry. So this is evidence that perhaps through this humiliation, And through the learning process of life and through losing Apple himself, because being fired from Apple, he still obviously had a lot of stock in Apple. But they were no longer going to hire him to the company that he founded. I mean, talk about a humiliation. And I think he probably had to really struggle with a a lot of ideas about himself during that time. Yeah. And I think he emerged with a more gray view of himself and other people rather than seeing himself as a god compared to other people. Another way of looking at it is that he probably became quite depressed and quite down during this time, and he needed someone to turn to for support. And I think to, you, know, you could narrativize the situation as he went crawling back to Chris Ann Brennan and Lisa for emotional support because he didn't have anyone else to turn to. Sure, yeah. So Jobs, at this point, developed a strong relationship with Lisa, and when she was nine, Jobs had her birth certificate changed, and her name went from Lisa Brennan 
to Lisa Brennan Jobs. So he redeemed himself at that point. Okay, so in 1996, he returns to Apple. At this point, Apple was really struggling financially. And I remember at the time, it was basically assumed Apple was going to be gone because IBM and Microsoft had completely dominated the, the, right. you know, the marketplace. In 1996, everything was Windows. I mean, yeah. Microsoft... And it wasn't just IBM. Like, it was all the like, HP Compaq, yeah. all the Gateway, all these machines were... Right. I mean, IBM clones. Yeah, exactly. It, basically, all those PCs, you know, what we call PC versus Apple yeah. now, from, I don't know, about the time of like maybe late 80s to mid 90s, Microsoft and the IBM clones just completely took off because I think it, they became cheaper. People could afford them. They they were shit. The, and the operating system was crap. And we we're talking about like what was what was well the Windows ninety five. Well, Windows ninety five was the first not shit entry into right. the. Was it like yeah. Windows four or something? Windows three point one. Three point one was the previous yeah incarnation, and that was still, if you recall, the. It was graphical, but only like very crudely. Right. And you still had to use DOS for almost everything. Right. Like, remember installing games meant configuring your auto exec and your config.sys, and you had to, the sound was always a problem. Yeah. You had to go in because, like, the sound blaster drivers, and you had to configure yeah. the IRQ set. It was a mess. Yeah. Plug and play was like yeah. plug and pray, as yeah. they call it. Yeah. And so, but for whatever reason, I think because Apple was too expensive and the fact that there was too much proprietary software that, that you know, there wasn't enough software for Apple. Like, if you wanted to use games and software, most of it was only available for IBM clones. And, and businesses didn't care about the complexity of the interface. They just cared about their three apps that every employee had to use. Right. And it was much cheaper to buy a PC clone put the three apps on there and you're done. Right. So in 1996, Apple announced that it would buy Next for half a billion dollars and Jobs became the CEO. So they basically, Apple at this point comes crawling back to Jobs <laughs> and says, uh, please come back. Please and, come back. And save us. Jobs terminated a number of projects such as the Newton. Do you remember the Newton? Yep. This was oh, 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 a handheld thing, right? It was the, the PDAs before PDAs. <laughs> right. It's basically an early iPhone yeah. with a stylus. Yeah. It, was, it was too early. It wasn't... <clears throat> the... Yeah, but for whatever reason, even though it, you know, these early products were basically iPhones, yeah. they just didn't come together in the way that yeah. an iPhone well, does. They, they were too complex. They had been designed with a desktop operating system uh, motif, you know? So it's still had folders and right. and it was it was a desktop operating system crammed into a little screen right. with a stylus right you needed the stylus right so it, and it took by the way it took a confluence perfect storm of the right hardware finally being able to be like touch only and and honestly them simplifying and saying no we don't need this no we don't need this no we don't need this no right. we don't need this and and i think that you can attribute to steve jobs there are other engineers i'm sure that had this idea and or were on board with steve steve jobs but this if you can point to one thing i think that you can say about steve jobs being a genius it is this because as a person who grew up with a lot all that tech i was totally in the wrong camp. I thought you needed things to be, you know, to, f to have functionality. Like when the first iPhone came out, I looked at it and laughed my ass off. Yeah. I said, this thing is never going to catch on. There's no keyboard. <laughs> you, you have to use the screen as a keyboard. That, that, that's never going to work. There's only one button. That's <laughs> never going to, you need more buttons, man. <laughs> it, that's never going to work. Because, you know, in my mind, you need a, you need a keyboard. And I actually, I thought, surely the, the next version of iPhone is going to have a flip-out keyboard because there's no <laughs> way. And, but Steve Jobs, in a number of different, you know, times in his career, you know, like the Macintosh, he's like, no, we're not going to have people putting in their own PCI cards. Yeah. It's, you're you're going to live with the way we built it. You have a, you have a MacBook right in front of you right now. Yep. There's no configuring. <laughs> you can't configure it. And... Steve Jobs was like, no, when you, make some, you, when you make a piece of art, you don't give people the opportunity to change it. Yeah. You, you make something that's so good that they don't even know they want it until you give it to them. And you don't want them messing with your stuff. Right. But the way computers were up until very recently 
was you need options. You need your own video card and your own hard drives and your own blah, blah, blah. And Steve Jobs was always against that. But by the way, the uh, options, because, you know, the iPhone, it's got a lot of configuring options. Like you can set your background, you can set your ringtone, but they're aesthetic, aesthetically trivial options. Right. What, what it isn't is the kind of stuff you, you, used, you were used to on a PC. Right. I'm going to go find the best video card, swap this one out. Ooh, right. what RAM should I get? Should I have, like, what? Right. <laughs> you know? right. But that was the state of, in fact, it still is. Right. When you build a PC, you make all those decisions. Right. And this is why Facebook beat MySpace. MySpace, you could do anything yeah. on. You could Full change HTML. <laughs> you could change everything on MySpace. And what that ended up resulting in was everyone's MySpace page looked like <laughs> shit. It was a mess. <laughs> you, I, I actually avoided MySpace because when I would click on someone's MySpace page, I wasn't sure what onslaught of vision <laughs> And audio stimulation was going to, you know, blast my brain. I mean, people would have lightning bolts. And I mean, literally, lightning bolts would come flashing across the entire screen. And three different songs would start because they don't know how to program it. And they don't realize that all three songs will start at the same time when you go to their page. And then Facebook comes out, and it's still this way. You can't do shit to that. <laughs> you can't do anything to it. it just, the background is white, and that's it. They just decided to focus on the on the connection part, you know? Right. Like, it's funny, because, like, I honestly do think um, it'd be neat to have a MySpace type thing, not for social circles and stuff, but it's more like, you know how LinkedIn, you can create your resume and stuff like that? I, I do think it'd be neat if I had a, a site where it is my my own um what do you call your shrine it's my shrine and i don't expect a lot of visitors because they're not gonna put up with all my shit but you know what i get to stare at (laughs) but that's not a social network (laughs) no so he also cut projects such as cyber dog do you remember cyber dog what (laughs) or open doc yeah, I do. I know what Open Doc, but you, what's Open Doc? It was basically a a, a format to because like they were trying to compete with Word, uh, with Word and all that stuff. I see. Unless I'm mistaken, but I think that's what it was. With the purchase of the next computer by Apple, much of the company's technology found its way into Apple products. Most notably, Next Step, which was developed by Next, the people, the engineers that did Next, was uh, evolved into Mac OS X, yeah. which is interesting. Under Jobs' guidance, the company increased sales significantly with the introduction of the iMac and other new products such as the iPod, iTunes, iPhone, and the iPad. And and, and what's interesting is uh, they had... This is something that, of course, happens to almost every great big company. You know, they... they, Mac or Apple had a line of computers. It, It had developed various different form factors and things and stuff. And one of the things he did, again, to his credit, like you're saying, is that, nope, we're going to have one, like, one portable thing, one desktop thing, one high-end desktop thing. Like, you know, I think in the mo- one of those movies, he's like, we're going to have five products, that's it. Right. You know? <laughs> right. Which is not like the way any other company operates. Right. You know, Doritos has 50 different flavors. That's right. Yeah. So, but at the time, when iMac came out, it sold for $1,300. He finally got a price point that was affordable. Yeah. And, and without fully sacrificing, because, you know, Macs have always been known and thought of as more expensive than right. PCs. They still are. Totally. But it was the perfect kind of balance so that people still felt they were play- the premium they were paying was worth it because of the style, the design. Yeah. I mean, at the time, the PC market was such that you bought everything from different people. <laughs> You, you, I was in this market at the time. You, you bought your, your tower and then you bought your board. You <laughs> bought your Intel processor, your AMD, and you bought your, your, your hard drives from someone else and your, your video cards. <laughs> and your speakers were from a different outfit. Your, your, and so the computer ended up looking like shit, you know, with these cords everywhere and your speakers and your, your external this and your... By the your, way, it's still like that. <laughs> basically. I mean, you're looking at my computer. Yeah. It's, it's basically like that. I but, built my last computer, my, but, my last PC. Yeah, but the iMac comes out and it's one unit. The speakers are in it. The yeah. CD-ROM is in it. The, it only accepts USB plugins, which right. was totally revolutionary at That's the time. Right. I mean, I still have a, you know, a Intel 
board here that has the ability to have those old style printers plugged into it. Right. You know what I mean? Right. And it had no disk drive. Yeah. Oh, it didn't. No disk drive. Oh, no, no, no floppy no disk. No floppy disk drive. Right. No floppy disk. Because still, all the PCs were coming out with the three and a, qu- and a half right. Right. Uh, uh, inch disk drive. Right. So then in, 20, in 2003, Jobs was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Despite his <sighs> diagnosis, Jobs resisted his doctor's recommendation for medical intervention for nine months. Instead, he relied on pseudoscience and natural healing. Oh. The chief doctor at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center said, Jobs' faith in alternative medicine likely cost him his life. And, and, and panc- pancreatic cancer, by the way, as, as, as we hopefully know, is... From Patrick Swayze. Is, is almost always lethal anyways. Right. Like, it's really bad to begin with. But... He had the only kind of, this is the doctor saying, he had the only kind of pancreatic cancer that is treatable and curable. Yeah. He essentially, the doctor said, he essentially committed suicide. According to Job's biographer, quote, for nine months, he refused to undergo surgery for his pancreatic cancer, a decision he later regretted as his health declined. He tried a vegan diet, acupuncture, herbal remedies, and other treatments he found online, and even consulted a psychic. He was also influenced by a doctor who ran a clinic that advised juice fasts, bowel cleansings, and other unproven approaches before finally having surgery in July of 2004. In 2008, Bloomberg mistakenly, the the publication Bloomberg, mistakenly published a long obituary for Steve Jobs. Do you remember this? No. Oh, really? It was famous. Yeah, so before Steve Jobs dies... Mm -hmm. They, <laughs> Bloomberg publishes his obituary oh with the dates not in there. You know what I mean? It's, it's like who accidentally? Holy shit! I mean, Steve Jobs. Like, yeah, get with it, people. Uh, he died in 2011, so he he survived for eight years with pancreatic cancer, which is amazing. Yeah, and he died from complications from his cancer. His sister Mona Simpson, the the author, described his death by saying, "Quote: Steve's final words hours earlier." were monosyllables repeated three times. Before embarking, he'd look at his sister Patty, his adopted sister Patty, that he grew up with. Then for a long time at his children. Then at his life's partner, Lorene, whom he married. And then over their, and then over their shoulders past them. Steve's final words were, Oh wow, oh wow, oh wow. He then lost consciousness and died several hours later. Apple, Microsoft, and Disney flew their flags at half-staff that day. Jobs is buried in an unmarked grave in Alta Mesa Memorial Park, which is the only non-denominational cemetery in Palo Alto. That's pretty amazing. Do you remember when they had the half-staff flags at Apple, Microsoft, and Disney? I, I mean, I remember when he died, yeah, but I didn't know all those details. All right, so what can we say about his psychology? Well, the first thing we can say is that he definitely had an attachment injury, or he most likely had an attachment injury, I should say. You know, he was adopted, which often carries with it some kind of attachment injury. And during the first year of life, his, his adoptive mother didn't want to love him for fear of losing him in the court battle. And she also had difficulty raising him because he was, quote unquote, a difficult child, which also probably led to some attunement issues in his early life. And this results often in people developing personality issues such as narcissism and a lack of empathy. Some people say, you know, he was a psychopath, like you were mentioning earlier, antisocial personality disorder. But I don't know. You can make a case for that, but I think narcissism better fits him. I I wasn't serious about the psychopath thing, but I I will say that um, I think he must have had uh, some set of things in addition to the narcissism that made him less capable at least early in life, of perceiving the emotional content, you know? Yeah. Narcissism... And maybe that's part of the narcissism. Yeah. Narcissism holds an element of a lack of okay. empathy. Yeah. Yeah, because the um, the accounts are just too consistent in that sense of like, you know, he, he didn't really care about injuring someone's feelings at all. Right. Yeah. So let's get into that. He was cruel to others, particularly his loved ones. So not only was he cruel to random people that we know a lot about from the accounts at Apple and this sort of thing, but he was particularly cruel to the people close to him, which is interesting. 
he lied to his best friends. He lied to Steve Wozniak. He took money from Steve Wozniak. Wozniak. Yeah. He attributed Steve Wozniak's creations to himself. He, he, and, he, and Chris Ann Brennan, whom he grew up with, it was his girlfriend. He, right. he loved her. And as soon as she gets pregnant, he just completely craps all over her and yeah. his own daughter. Right. I mean, in, in the movie, the, the most recent Steve Jobs movie, uh, by Aaron Sorkin, you really, really see <laughs> how horrible he was to his daughter and to Chris Ann. And they kind of make Chris Ann to be kind of a crazy person, actually, in the movie, which I didn't read anything on. Uh, by the way, I, I haven't seen the new movie. I'm sure it's, uh, I'm sure it's great. Uh, but um, I actually liked the um, Ashton Kutcher movie. No yeah, one likes it. I, no, I liked but, it. Or I shouldn't say no. But other than us two, no one. <laughs> yeah. No, but it was it was not well received broadly. Yeah. It doesn't have great reviews. I didn't think it was like an amazing movie. No. But first of all, I thought Kutcher Kutcher surprised me. He yeah. did a good job. Yeah. And, and he looks way he more looks like, him like him than yeah. Michael Fassbender yeah. does. So that yeah. definitely helped. Um, and then the other one that was not a good movie but was very interesting was the Pirates of Silicon Valley back right. in the day. Right. But this, I t- remind me. The Aston Kutcher version, did they portray Steve Jobs as like the single genius at Apple or did they comment on how he was part of a team? Uh, They certainly make it a lot more about... Because if I remember right, they made it seem like Steve Jobs was the single genius behind the iMac when... When you read the actual account, they're like, no, there were several engineers involved, no, I several creative minds involved in this. I didn't get that sense because, like, first of all, they, I thought they did a really good job of showing him self-destruct, self-destroying, but, but also showing that there was, and maybe this is wrong, but they did show that even when he was self-destroying and being got uh, pushed out of Apple, there was a sense in that movie of like, but he's kind of right as well. So they, I think they were maybe uh, favoring it a little too much in his favor. Right. But then when he when he came back, they did do a good job, I, I thought, of showing that he was a little different, a little change, and that he was more interested in collaborating with not everyone, but because like they show John Ivy and they show him interacting with him, not the real John Ivy, obviously. Yeah. But so I didn't get the sense. Pl- but plus the movie ends; it, it starts ending right around there, so it doesn't go on to show him single-handedly doing everything. It just shows that he comes back, he makes some draconian decisions, and then it kind of fast-forwards a little bit to the to the iPod thingy, or maybe the iPhone thing, and then like that's the end of the movie. Yeah, Wozniak said that, and many other people close to Steve Jobs, said that the Ashton Kutcher version was crap. and That it made him look too good or something? Yeah, and that it played loose with a lot of the details. And actually, if my memory serves, when I watched it, I was like, did Apple make this movie? Because it's very pro Steve Jobs in some ways. And so I remember thinking that, you know. I mean, the thing you got to remember is whenever you're making something as complicated as a mass-produced computer with literally millions of different components, it, you have to involve several people. And Steve Jobs was one of the key players, but yeah. he wasn't. He didn't yeah. create the iMac. Yeah, yeah. A team created the yeah. iMac. They definitely. I will say no. You're right. It, it definitely made it feel like he walks in the room. He's the genius. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And in the the new movie, the one with Michael Fassbender, they comment a lot more on that. Okay. Wozniak will walk in and say, like, you realize that you're not the only one who did this. Yeah. And they have this interesting conversation where Steve Jobs is like, well, yeah, I know. But, you know, I essentially makes this makes this analogy that he's the conductor of the orchestra. Yeah. And he's the, the true creator and the genius. And sure, sure, Wozniak, you're a flute player. You you play the flute, but but you didn't create the the symphony. I created the symphony. You're just yeah. you're just a, a you you just did what I told you to do. And that was his attitude. And Wozniak comes back at him. It's just like, dude, you're such a dick, <laughs> essentially. Um, anyway, so he's cruel to others. Andy Andy Hertzfeld, who's actually a prominent figure, uh, a prominent character in the new movie, he was an uh, Apple engineer who stayed friends with Jobs said, the one question I'd love Steve to answer is, why are you sometimes so mean? And when a journalist asked Steve Jobs to answer this question that Hertzfeld put forth, Steve Jobs said, 
this is who I am and you can't expect me and you can't expect me to be someone I'm not. <laughs> and, and honestly, it's just that, like what a dick. But that's a common reaction from people that um, when they're young, they end up becoming independently powerful. What I mean by that is you see that with stars, you see that with athletes, you see it with uh, powerful billionaires and things like that. If, if they gain that at a young age, and I think the younger, the worse, mm. there is something that it's like, well, life has given me only evidence that I am the greatest. Right. So you can say whatever you want. A, I don't need to hear that. I have all the money I need. Right. Uh, I am the famous one. Right. So how could, I am right. Yeah. And Wozniak even commented on that in an interview. He said, basically, Steve Jobs personality froze at the time that Apple made yeah, it big. Right. And that it wasn't until much later that he started to develop personality wise. And so and, there's and, some evidence of that. And then it also might have something to do with uh okay, because like take Warren Buffett. Now I don't know the guy, right? But I, I've read a lot of articles and interviews with him and things like that. He seems like a fairly balanced individual. Yeah. The accounts about him don't seem like he's that big of a dick or anything like that, you know. But he's a billionaire, right? And he's had successes in life for a long time, right? But there is something interesting. Like his path in life has not been as public. I know now he's famous and stuff like that, right? But he didn't invent the Mac or he didn't do this and that. And I wonder if there's a little bit of the the spotlight, how much that has an effect. Right. You know, like when, you have, when you're Justin Bieber. Right. I was just going to say yeah. Bieber. Yeah. I mean, yeah, Jesus, Beaver, for crying out loud. Like, have you seen him being a dick on stage lately, right? Oh, is it still? <laughs> oh, is he not growing up yet? Well, you, you haven't heard of the, the news stories just this no, week? No, no. He's been a colossal dick to his, to his audience. Like, he was in Europe or something, and he's playing a song, and it's like an acoustic song or something. Mm -hmm. And they're clapping on the one and the three instead of the two and the four which kind of drives me crazy as a musician. But, you know, people do that. Sure. And he stops the song in the middle of the song. It says, and in, in a very condescending way, he says like, look, if you're going to clap, at least clap on the right beat. Do it like this. Uh, uh. And it, it's on the internet. What? Yeah. Total dick. And then, and then the same month or same week, he came out and... He, I think something was spilled on the stage and he was trying to clean it up and it was right in front of the sea of girls that are right up against the stage and the girls can touch him and, you know, naturally they're going to try to touch him. Right. And he's seriously trying to wipe something up and he's like, come on, give me a break. Like, back up, back up. And the girls are like, uh, and he's, and then he just walks off the stage and didn't come back. He's like, I'm out of here. I'm not. And that was like the first song. What? Yeah. Okay, you're at a Bieber concert, you're 13, and the Biebs is now within hand's reach of you, and you're, and you're crazed, <laughs> yeah. and you're not going to try to touch him? Yeah. You know, like, but, it, but it makes sense. The guy's what, 21? I don't know. 23 at most? Young. I don't know. Yeah. And he started uber fame at like 12 or some shit. Right. It's not real. Yeah. It, like it's the Michael Jackson thing. It's a world... Yeah that we can't understand. Yeah, it's terrible. And they can't understand. Right. I mean, a big part of teenage development is realizing that you ain't shit. Yeah. And when you are shit, then that's yeah. going to screw up your personality. In fact, um, I don't know the data on this, but you know how in high school, uh, it seems anecdotally, a lot of times the popular ones end up struggling a bit later in life. Yeah. <laughs> right. And people who grow up with a very strong, robust sense of their idiocy and their, their non-shitness, <laughs> uh, perhaps grow up with a more well-balanced personality, <laughs> let's just say that. So, okay, there's lots of evidence of his narcissism. So again, we have his attachment injury leading to both narcissism and cruelty. There's lots of reasons and lots of evidence that he became an, an, a narcissist. And I just want to provide a quote from Psychology Today. Someone wrote, along with some fellow Psych Today bloggers, there is no doubt in my professional judgment that Jobs met criteria for a narcissistic personality disorder. He was preoccupied with his sense of importance and his brilliance. He consistently damaged others by exploiting and bullying them, 
and could be completely unempathetic to their feelings. He was envious of others' attention. He was arrogant and haughty, and he was controlling and manipulative. Along with these overt characteristics, Jobs almost certainly had what many professional psychologists believe to be at the root of narcissistic personality disorder, which is a fundamentally insecure sense of self. So I agree with this, but again, we can't diagnose Steve Jobs because we don't have access to him as a patient. And if we did, we couldn't talk about it without his, without his consent. You know, but there is a fair amount of evidence. I don't know if it's full-blown narcissistic personality disorder, but definitely narcissism narcissistic traits. So, for instance, again, to review, his parents treated him as special. They defended him against the school. They paid for everything. He even said that they treated him like a special person. And they, they paid for everything, as, you know, even though they weren't wealthy. He skipped a grade. He was rejected by his peers. He was intelligent. He was power hungry and controlling. He took credit for things he didn't do because he wanted to be seen as a genius, right? And he, he was dismissive of, of his loved ones because hey, that, he thought he was special. Sorry, that was an interesting point. I hadn't even looked at it that way. Because I was thinking, he took credit, what a dick. But I hadn't even thought, he took credit because he desperately wanted to become what he, what he was told or, or what, his, his mythology. I'm clearly super special. Right. I'm clearly genius. So I guess, you know, implicitly I'll just do this and then people will think I'm a genius. Right. <laughs> right. If, you know, the thing that really distinguished Steve Jobs from other people in his posi- position, because, you know, like Bill Gates and these people are, you know, a similar position, is that Steve Jobs wanted to create a myth about Steve Jobs, whereas other people don't necessarily want that. Like, I don't think Bill Gates necessarily wanted to create a myth right. about Bill right. Gates. Like, Bill Gates has his own stories about, like, near Asperger's-like yeah. behavior and stuff like that. But uh, he actually, like, remember, he started he started quitting Microsoft when the whole trial stuff happened. Right. Because he's like, oh, I'm being thrown into the limelight in a bad way. Like, I can't handle I don't want this. You right, know? <laughs> right. Whereas Steve Jobs, from the very beginning, wanted to create the brand of Steve Jobs. Right. And that requires people thinking that he created these things. Mm-hmm. And he loved that. He, want, he loved being associated with the creation of all these things. And now, having said that, I, I've seen some interviews where he does kind of attribute other people to having bit, built these things, but he would what never... Do you mean, what do you mean other people? Well, he would say like, we created, not I created, uh, but I he would never identify those people. He would say like, and then we hired so-and-so who's a genius and, and I'm, I'm so lucky to have, to have had him because he did this and this and this, but he, he wouldn't frame it that way. He always framed it like it was us it was me orchestrating. It was, it was, you know, this was me. It was me. It was me. And I think people bought into it because you remember the whole Apple versus PC bullshit, which always bothered me. But, you know, and there was some religious fervor. Absolutely. On, on both sides. <laughs> absolutely. And, and Steve Jobs was the Pope. And the worshipers worshiped Steve Jobs. Yeah. And he played into that. And he, he, was, he was already doing, he was already preparing to become the Pope before he was the Pope at that point. And so, you know, it, it's just further evidence of, it, of his narcissism. Again, fueled by a shaky self-esteem and also extreme attachment insecurity based on his early childhood related to his mother neglecting him emotionally. Unbelievable. Like the, the fact that, that you could draw lines, um, you know, because there, there's so many times in life where things don't have a clear explanation, you know. Uh, and so imagine if you had found out in your research that, you know, he wasn't adopted. He's, he was born from the same parents. They were happily married. Uh, they, his r- reports from his childhood were all positive and one day he became a dick. <laughs> right. Yeah. There's a long theme. Yeah. Me- much data. And I and the data I have is only what I could find briefly on the internet. Think about if you were actually, you know, there and knew him. Yeah. There's probably tons of data showing that he was, you know, narcissistic from the beginning and low self-esteemed from the beginning. I feel like there are two aspects of what I I've heard and kind of have now known about him that I think were helpful to him 
one was the thing I was saying earlier, which is a little bit of the crazy, I could do anything. And then the other one was his ability to cut through bullshit and say, you know what, just do that one thing. Right. So you could make the argument that because he was narcissistic and because he didn't have as much empathy as other people, that he could cut through the bullshit of administration, essentially, and to make people do things without caring about their feelings, right? It's like, look, we have a deadline. We have to release this thing. I don't care about your feelings. Fuck you. You're going to do this or you're going to be fired. Ah, I see. I, I, let, me, let me modify a little because I was actually talking. I'm not sure that, that part of it was good, but... Could but be could a pro. Be, could, could be a pro. I was thinking more of a subtle version of that, which is the a subtler, subtler version of that, which was the when he came back, for example, and said, we're going to cut this product, this product, this product, this product. Right. We're only going to do these five things. Now, granted, those still take a little bit of lack of empathy, right? Because, right. or quite a bit, because you're like, yeah. yeah, we might even have to let some people go, or at least they're not going to get to keep working on their project. Yeah. And I don't care how long they've worked on their project. I've seen this before, actually. When you have a leader that has empathy, that actually can work against you when cuts need to be made. Yeah. Because when you cut things, you're firing people and you're ruining their lives. Yep. You, you literally are taking jobs away f- and money away from these people. They might lose their house. Their marriages might fall apart. These are very real decisions. And if you have empathy, you might go, I can't, well, you might start, you know, storing the situation in your mind so that you don't have to cut that group. That's and right. I've seen this firsthand yeah. in leaders I've been associated with. Yeah. And so when you, when, you, when you need to make those tough choices, sometimes you want someone that doesn't have any empathy. Yeah. <laughs> All right, what's the final word, Birdo? Is, is Steve Jobs an asshole or a genius? Um, I honestly think that no one can be involved in so many like culture-changing projects and not have some great amount of uh, something about him. <laughs> Should he be, a, like say 100 years from now, yeah. as time will heal the wounds mm-hmm. of his problems, right? Should we, you know, for instance, when we think of the uh, the uh, ending of slavery. Yeah. Who's the face we have? Lincoln. Right. But there were hundreds of people involved yeah. in that movement. And he came late to the party. <laughs> right. And he had some issues yeah. with racism itself and this yeah. kind of... When a hundred years from now, we look back on the emergence of personal computers and technology and the internet and all that stuff, should Steve Jobs' face be the face that people remember? Well, in the historical zoological simulation that will be in a hundred years human life. Uh, yeah, I mean, yes, I, I think, uh, I, I don't know if it's a one face beast. I would maybe make it like a, a Cerberus type three headed dog or something. Who's the, who's the other two? Uh, you know, you'd put Bill Gates in there for sure. Who else? Um, well, of course, Gore. <laughs> well, probably a uh, Facebook guy, you know, Mark Zuckerberg. But yeah. see, it's not even fair because what about Larry and Surya from Google? What about Wozniak? What about Wozniak? <laughs> so maybe we need we need a, a Medusa. What about Linux? We need a Med- Linus Torval. We need a Medusa with lots of little tendrils. What about whoever invented the mouse at Xerox? Oh, we don't even know his name or her. Why do oh. you say him? Because sexist. It was sexist, you're right. <laughs> oh, and what about uh, Tim Berners-Lee, right? Yeah. So, okay, so here's the bottom line. You, you've just pointed out several holes with that idea that w- that should be that face, right? But it will be his face. It, I absolutely believe in 100 years, when they look back yeah. at our generation, yeah. Steve Jobs will be the That'll most... Be the face? He, it will be, he'll be the only one anyone remembers from our generation. I, I, I don't know. Like like Albert Einstein, for instance. When Elon you, when, Musk. When you <laughs> no, I doubt it. Uh, when when we think about you know science and the atomic bomb, we think of Albert Einstein. But again, there were there were hundreds of figures involved in that whole thing. But <sighs> but, but, but we only remember uh, him. But when that's we, a, that's a little that's a little different in that Einstein literally. I, I mean, he had a in 1905. He had five universe changing papers or whatever it's yeah. like i mean steve jobs but that's uh, your that's your 2015 eyes looking back if we lived 
in 19... Well, but isn't that the fair way to do it? Yeah. But if we lived in 1930, yeah. my guess is, is we'd absolutely go, absolutely Einstein. But there's all these others. But there's all these yeah. others. But, there's but Nuren, isn't it... There's isn't Nuremberg? It, yeah. Nuremberg. No. What's his name? No, not Nuremberg. Heisenberg? Heisenberg. Heisenberg and... Um, God damn it. Well, so there's there's Neil, Niels Bohr. There is... Bohr. Um, I'm, oh, there's one guy I'm trying to think of. Uh, uh, from the Manhattan uh, yeah. Project. Um, um, another German guy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's in that Sting song. <laughs> um, God damn it. He was in charge of the Manhattan... Schopenhauer. No. Uh, uh, I, no. Schopen, Schopenhauer. Um, no. I mean, I literally think if I type in atomic bomb and look at Wikipedia, yeah, 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 yeah. it'll be the first name that, that pops up. Wait, wait, don't do it. Let me, let me, let me look it up, but let me, let me do it. So, okay, so there's Schrodinger, there is Niels Bohr, Schopen, Schopen, oh, Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer. 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 See, I was close with Schopenhauer. Oppenheimer. <laughs> yeah. God damn it, Oppenheimer. John Jacob Oppenheimer Smith. <laughs> anyway, so, you know, we think of Einstein, and in another hundred years, people won't even remember Oppenheimer. Who? And, and in a hundred years <laughs> from now, people will only remember Steve Jobs. And I think that's a crime because he's obviously a figure, but I really don't think he deserves to be the icon of our age, in my opinion. Plus, he was a dick. And I think he should, he should, he should, have, that, here's he should the, have that association here's with Here's the him. problem with your theory, though, or like your lack of theory. <laughs> because Apple is currently the highest valuated tech company by far like they have enough cash to buy google and facebook <laughs> you know they do like they, they're valued like like um it's like 200 billion or something crazy like that you know also uh everyone knows that the coolest phone is the iPhone, right? Right. Now, that's not necessarily true, but most people think of it that way, right? Every phone is an I is an iPhone knockoff. Now, there is a flip side to this. He's not around anymore. Right. And products are moving forward. Right. So, what if in the next 5 years it's it's other stuff that's important? I don't know. But Steve Jobs will be attributed to the whole thing. The, well, in, in 100 but, years from now, children will be taught there was once a man named Steve Jobs who had a vision. And, and he invented the iPhone, the internet, the iPad, everything mm. that you see today. Your, your iPhone version 32 was invented by Steve Jobs. That, that it, that'll be the message mm. that children will walk away with. Because that's what I was told when I was a kid. Once there was a man in Illinois mm. who was a lawyer and he ch was chopped down trees and he decided to end slavery. And yeah. he ended slavery <laughs> against all odds. Yeah. Like that's the story. Yeah. And because it, history gets reduced for simplicity's sake, and I just think Steve Jobs will be that person 100 years from now. One difference, you, you may very well be right, but one, one difference between both the Einstein and the, uh, what's it called, uh, Lincoln examples, um, slavery has in fact ended and it hasn't returned since then, right? Uh, it also, you know, affected a whole, I mean, it was, it was monumental. Uh, relativity... Uh, the properties of light, all these kind of, uh, the photoelectric effect, all these things uh, fundamentally change physics and still change it until now they're still trying to do the next thing, right? And that's over a hundred years later, right? And, but, and whereas, 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 the jobs impact was only over 20 years and it's not clear that that tech will be the, the thing later. And he did not single-handedly invent... Well, he the, wasn't the one, you're right. <laughs> that's the you're whole right. thing. It's like... At least Einstein wrote those papers. Right. And Lincoln single-handedly freed all the slaves. <laughs> well, Lincoln happened Chopped to be all the president, you know what I mean? But, but yeah, it's Jobs was part of a team. Yeah. And these other figures are just not now, mentioned. And you're right, because even in Einstein's case, which again, like I give him all the credit, but he, he was building his papers on top of Maxwell and on top of other things. Right. Like, it was very much a collaboration. <laughs> right. And there were many other scientists that furthered his theory yep. and added elements to it. And Einstein was wrong about a lot of things. And so, yeah, uh, I just think, I, you know, as a person who was never uh, an Apple, what do you call it, acolyte or disciple, yeah. I, I just feel like it's a bit of a bummer that he's going to be the icon of our age especially because he was a dick. If he was super nice to people, or at least just normally nice, I would have an easier time with it. But after watching this, this movie with Michael Fassbender, you, you see just how miserable he made everyone feel around him. 
and how much he, and of course this isn't a documentary, but again, Steve Wozniak's going, oh my God, that's exactly the way he was. You just realize, and that's the central question in, in the movie is that Steve Wozniak's character actually asks is, look, great, you're a genius, awesome. Why do you have to be a jerk to everybody? You don't, there's, those two things don't have to go hand in hand. And Steve Wozniak in interviews would say that. He says, imagine if Steve Jobs was a normal guy and not quite as mean. He would be a god to us right now because everyone could get behind him. But because he was a jerk, he put a fly in the ointment and makes it hard for people to get behind him. Yeah. It's like, imagine if Paul McCartney was an asshole. Right. Then you, you would have to admit his music's amazing. Right. But then there would always be the but. Right. And that's another part of this that always bothers me is people say, well, he couldn't have achieved all this in, unless he was an asshole. But look at all the other... All the non- other people. Like all the other, yeah, look at all the other non-assholes yeah. who achieved all sorts of greatness. Actually, there are some accounts that Einstein was an asshole. In, in not his, in the same in his, way, though. Not in, well, in his personal life. Yeah, I know he, he cheated and all this stuff, but... But yeah, I mean, but, you know, there are plenty... Like Paul McCartney, for instance. And, yeah. And all these people, it's like... Well, uh, okay. Steve, Stevie Wonder, uh, you know. I mean, look, let, let's, let's be honest, right? Like, nine out of ten people are assholes or dicks or whatever to random to some people in their lives or they're not they're flawed individuals anyways right yeah so just because you're specially gifted in one way or another doesn't all of a sudden remove your humanity from you yeah but there's a difference there's levels there are levels of dickishness right (laughs) all right well that does it for another episode of psychology in seattle thanks for joining us on this long journey in which we analyze the psychology of steve jobs please take care of yourself out there because You deserve it. You really do. Goodbye. So long. Farewell. A vida sin adieu. 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 And me and you. (laughs) 